At the other end of the demographic spectrum, Singapore is one of the fastest ageing nations in the world. By 2030, one in four Singaporeans will be aged 65 and above, up from one in six today. While many are living longer, some do spend their final years in ill health. And this, coupled with smaller household sizes, will mean an increased burden of care for families. Nursing homes are suitable for the elderly with high care needs and little to no family support. But we cannot rely on nursing homes as the mainstream solution. In fact, many seniors themselves prefer to be cared for in the community and to grow old in an environment that is familiar to them, surrounded by their loved ones. We will therefore need to review and update our approaches to aged care to ensure seniors live as much of their lives in good health as possible and have ample options to age in the community. Our first line of defence is that of preventive care, and that is why our priority is to support seniors to take care of their own health, including by remaining physically and mentally active and staying engaged in their communities. And that's why we have introduced Healthier SG as an empowering strategy so that seniors can take preventive steps, preventive care steps, together with their doctors and community partners to improve their health. This will enable seniors to keep chronic illnesses at bay, or if they do contract them, to detect the diseases early so that these can be kept under control. The refreshed action plan for successful ageing launched last month supports Healthier SG by setting out a comprehensive set of initiatives for seniors to better care for themselves, continue contributing and stay connected. But for seniors to stay active and healthy or to better manage their existing chronic illnesses, they will need stronger support in the community, outside of hospitals and clinics. So as part of the Forward Singapore exercise, we are studying how we can enhance the range of care and support options within the community. This includes reviewing the operating model of active ageing centres and examining how we can better strengthen and coordinate the providers in the aged care sector, which is highly fragmented today. In the meantime, we will increase the resources dedicated to supporting seniors, especially lower-income seniors with their long-term care and healthcare needs. I will top up the Elder Care Fund by $500 million to support means-tested subsidies for seniors who need home-based, centre-based or institutional care. I will also top up the Medifund by $1.5 billion to strengthen the safety net for lower-income individuals and seniors facing financial difficulties with their medical bills, even after government subsidies, MediShield Life and MediSafe. As our population ages, we will also have to address the retirement needs of Singaporeans. Uh, we have enhanced the CPF system over the years, such as through workfare and extra interest on lower CPF balances. We now have silver support to supplement the retirement income of seniors who had lower incomes in their working years. And we also encourage family members with more means to top up their loved ones' CPF through tax reliefs and matching grants. We are considering what more we can do to enhance retirement adequacy in our Forward Singapore deliberations. Meanwhile, in this budget, I will make several moves to help specific segments. In particular, the government had earlier convened the Advisory Committee on Platform Workers to look into strengthening protections for platform workers, including improving their housing and retirement adequacy. The government has accepted the committee's recommendations, one of which was to align the CPF contribution rates of platform workers and companies with those of employees and employers over a period of five years. So platform workers who are below 30 years old when the changes are implemented will be required to make increased CPF contributions. And platform companies will also be required to pay CPF contributions for these platform workers. These changes will help platform workers raise their total earnings and strengthen their housing and retirement adequacy. But in the short term, they will affect 
the take-home pay of these workers. I will therefore introduce additional support to help lower-income platform workers cushion the impact. For the first four years after implementation, I will provide a CPF transition support to lower-income platform workers who see an increase in their CPF contribution rates. More information on this transition support is in the Annex, and the Manpower Minister will also share more at the SCOS. We will also make some CPF adjustments for older workers in line with the recommendations of the Tripartite Work Group on Older Workers. We implemented the first increase in CPF contribution rates for senior workers in 2022 and the second increase earlier this year. For these two increases, the government had provided employers with a CPF transition offset to alleviate the increase in business costs. We will continue with the next increase in CPF contribution rates in 2024 and likewise provide employers with a similar offset. In addition, I will increase the minimum CPF monthly payout for seniors on the retirement sum scheme to $350 a month. I will also help middle-income Singaporeans save more for their retirement by raising the CPF monthly salary ceiling. The CPF salary ceilings were last raised in 2016. To keep pace with rising salaries, we will raise the monthly salary ceiling from $6,000 to $8,000 in 2026. We will phase in the increases over four years, starting from this year, to allow employers and employees adjust to the changes.